You need magnesium and vitamin C to make bone. You need a lot of other things too. I mean, there's over a dozen nutrients. But when they declared calcium is the treatment for osteopenia and osteoporosis, they relegated so many women to heart disease, bone spurs, heel spurs, gallstones, kidney stones, and soft tissue breast calcifications. Hello, welcome, welcome, welcome. It is episode 472 of the Keto Diet Podcast. Now, if you've been listening over the last couple of weeks, I have been mentioning that I am renaming the show, and next week is going to mark the very first episode of, drumroll please, Healthful Pursuit Podcast. It should come as no surprise that I'm going back to my roots with the name Healthful Pursuit If you've been around these parts for quite some time, you know that I set up my health blog back in 2010 called Healthful Pursuit. And when I was mulling over, praying, just really taking my time with this decision of renaming the Keto Diet Podcast, Healthful Pursuit just made the most sense. Is it, if I could go back in time, would I have named my business Healthful Pursuit? Probably not, because the word healthful is so hard to say to pronounce properly, to communicate over audio. And you might hear me saying helpful or healthful. And it's just, it's a mouthful. So, but we're doing it. We're renaming the show to Healthful Pursuit Podcast. So be sure to tune in next week when you see the podcast, you're going to see the title change, but all the episodes are going to be staying here okay, we're not making any other changes other than a new intro. Everything else remains the same. The quality of the show, the guests, the purpose behind the show, really nothing is changing because if I'm being honest over the last couple of years of seeing functional wellness from a broader scope, I just see that there's so much more to if it fits your macros and we're really aligning the purpose of the show with the title of the show. And it's no longer just about keto. And I felt like I was doing a disservice by continuing up with the keto diet podcast branding. So everything else will remain the same, but this is the last episode of the keto diet podcast. And next week it'll just be called the healthful pursuit podcast. And you'll still be able to access all the episodes from the past. We're going to keep coming up with shows every Tuesday, literally nothing else is changing, but the name. So we're going to be talking about magnesium today. It is one of my most favorite minerals and also one that's just very misunderstood. I wanted to start off by talking about some high magnesium foods and like how to practically bring more magnesium into your diet. So I kind of outlined kind of a good way to combine certain foods together to get like a good amount of magnesium. So I'm going to outline kind of a diet, like a day of eating that's going to give you about a thousand milligrams of magnesium. And then we're going to get into the topic of conversation, who we're interviewing, all those things. So if you were to have sauteed spinach with any sort of meat, maybe some eggs, a small banana, and a piece of like a couple bits of almonds over top of those sauteed spinach. That's breakfast. That's going to give you around 250 milligrams of magnesium for snack. If it included some pumpkin seeds, about one ounce is 150 milligrams of magnesium for lunch. If you had a salmon filet with some black beans and broccoli, maybe added some quinoa to that if you're doing grains. And if not, even that salmon filet and broccoli is going to give you about hundred milligrams of magnesium all combined. If you added things like quinoa and black beans, you're looking at 350 or so of, of milligrams of magnesium for lunch. If your snack had an avocado in it, that's 60 milligrams of magnesium. And if your dinner had things like kale, potato, you're looking at around 100 milligrams of magnesium right there. So just to kind of start to tune you up to the conversation we're going to be having is really this balance between supplemental magnesium and dietary magnesium. So I wanted to outline how to kind of get that in and start thinking about both from a supplement perspective and a diet perspective. So we're chatting with 
Carolyn Dean, MD and ND, who's a medical doctor, a naturopath and bestselling author. She has spent 50 plus years committed to applying the science of medicine and the gifts of nature to help people feel better, find more energy, take control of their personal health and so much more. Dr. Dean follows the 2017 revisions of the 2004's best-selling book, The Magnesium Miracle, with her newest revision, Magnesium, The Missing Link to Total Health. So we're going to be talking about why we're so deficient in magnesium, how much magnesium we need on an ongoing basis, the balance between magnesium and calcium, why we should care. We're going to be talking about what magnesium does in the body that it has over, it controls 80% of our metabolic processes. 80% of what our body needs in order to function requires magnesium. So deficiencies in magnesium are going to show up as all sorts of things. In fact, Carolyn was chatting about how the over 65 medical diagnoses are linked to magnesium. We're going to be talking about the laxative effect that you get when you take magnesium supplementation and some of the drawbacks and issues with just regular magnesium. We're going to be talking about different forms of magnesium, how to know what to take and the cofactors that are required. And then she blows my mind at the end by talking about specific medications that are fluoride based and their impact on magnesium, which I had no idea about. So it blew my mind. If you want to learn more from Dr. Carolyn, you can go to rnareset.com. She also has a website, drcarolyndean.com. She's on Instagram as Dr. Carolyn Dean and also on YouTube as Dr. Carolyn Dean, MDND4601. I will include the links in the show notes. So if you're unsure, head on over to ketodietpodcast.com for the show notes or just click around wherever you're listening to this audio and find the links over there. Okay, let's cut over to our time with Dr. Carolyn Dean. Hey, my name is Leanne Vogel. I'm fascinated with helping women navigate how to eat, move, and care for their bodies using a low-carb diet. I'm a small town holistic nutritionist turned three-time international best-selling author turned functional medicine practitioner offering telemedicine services around the globe to women looking to better their health and stop second-guessing themselves. I'm here to teach you how to wade through the wellness noise to get to the good stuff that'll help you achieve your goals. We're supporting your low-carb life beyond the if it fits your macros conversation hormones, emotions, relationship to your body, workouts, letdowns, motivation, blood work, detoxing, metabolism. I'm providing the tools to put your motivation into action. Think of it like quality time with your bestie mixed with a little med school so you're empowered at your next doctor visit. Get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn about your body and how to care for it better. This is the Keto Diet Podcast. Hi, Carolyn. How are you? I'm really well. Thank you very much. It's good to see your bright face. I'm in darkness here. It's 5 a.m. in Maui. And you sound so chipper. What's your secret? Well, you know, you get up early in a place where you spend a lot of your time outdoors. So our morning now starts around 5.30. So I get up and do an hour and a half, two-hour walk down by the ocean every morning. So it draws you out. So you get up early. So true. I am living that same life here now in Florida. And there's nothing like starting the day going for a beach walk before it gets way too hot to even entertain the idea. (laughs) Right, exactly. And see, that's part of what we're going to talk about is minerals. Well, the ocean, did you know that there's three times the magnesium in the ocean than there is calcium? So In my world, I want to have more magnesium than calcium. Yes. And anytime my training schedule gets pretty hectic and I'm feeling it in my body, I'm like, time for a beach soak. And I go right down into the ocean, bring my little floaty and hang out. And, oh, it just makes the body so, so happy. I'm sure you can talk about why that is and what's going on there. Before we kind of get into it, how did you get involved with magnesium? Like what was it that was that trigger for you? Well, I did my medical 
degree first and then right away my naturopathic. So I learned about the minerals, but it wasn't until, well, after I practiced in Toronto for about 14 years, I went to New York to do a clinical research trial on AIDS for Pete's sakes in the early 90s. After a few years there, I was on The View and I wrote a little book and then Random House asked me to write a book on magnesium. And I thought, yeah, how can you write a 300-page book on one mineral? But it wasn't long before I realized that I was a poster child for magnesium deficiency. And I was having the, the eye twitches and the headaches and the neck tension, the insomnia, the leg cramps, Charlie horse leg cramps. It was terrible. And I went right out to get uh, magnesium and got the laxative effect from more than 50 milligrams. So it was, it just opened up my whole world when I realized how bad I felt and how much magnesium I thought I needed, but I couldn't take more than 50 milligrams without the laxative effect. So being a very inquisitive person, I really thought, well, this could be hampering so many people. And, and that was back in the early 2000s that the, the magnesium miracle came out. So I've been working at this for 25 years. Right after I published the book, I began a quest to find a chemist or a mineral company that would make a non-laxative magnesium. And over the years, and it wasn't until 2018, I found a research article that by Dr. Workinger, and she said that 80% of known metabolic functions require magnesium, 80%. And by that time in the 2016 to 2020, I documented about 65 medical conditions that could be misdiagnosed as they're really magnesium deficiency, and they were misdiagnosed as medical conditions. So I realized that people were taking so many drugs for something that could be treated with magnesium. But then at the same time, Leanne, we have the FDA who tells us as dietary supplement companies, which I have, that we're not allowed to say that dietary supplements can treat disease. Only drugs can treat disease. So while I'm talking to you, I'm not allowed to mention my products by name. And it's very frustrating because people are in an educational bind and we depend on podcasts like yours to get some information out there. Yeah, it's so true. And then there's the information that's incorrect too. Like I had an interaction with an individual actually this week on Instagram and she was selling a cortisol regulation supplement and we kind of went back and forth and she's like, it's a fat burner. And it, I was like, but it has caffeine. Like how can this regulate high cortisol? And she was like making stuff up. <laughs> and so I think too, it, it becomes very challenging as an individual who doesn't have hours and hours and hours to delve deep and kind of figure things out. And that's why, oh gosh, I take my job and I know you do too. You take your job so seriously because you want to be correct. You want to lead people well with the up-to-date information. Can you explain to us why we're so deficient in magnesium? Like, why is this happening? Why are there over 65 medical diagnoses linked to magnesium deficiency? Why are we struggling with this magnesium situation? Right. Well, it, it's easy to explain because, um, a hundred years ago, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, we were able to get 500 milligrams of magnesium in our diet. And now we're lucky to get 200 milligrams. And I think we need 500 to 600. And also to balance that out, we only need about 600 milligrams of calcium. But we're being told to take 1,200, 1,500. So there's this whole mineral imbalance where allopathic medicine is pushing calcium, but they ignore magnesium to the extent that they don't even have it on an electrolyte panel. If you think about it, if you've ever had your electrolytes done, sodium is there, potassium, calcium is there, chloride, no magnesium. And yet 
all the studies, yeah, tens of hundreds of studies, maybe, yeah, I could even say tens of thousands of studies show the benefits of magnesium. But the focus of the magnesium research in the past was on magnesium oxide. Somehow, an entrepreneur who had a magnesium oxide company, it was a woman, she gave uh, samples to all these researchers of her magnesium oxide. So you'll see the, the early studies on magnesium are all magnesium that is only 4% absorbed. But Leanne, even then, all the magnesium oxide studies are positive. They showed benefits because people are so magnesium deficient that their body will grab anything. So my mission has been, as I said, to find a magnesium that could be fully absorbed, non-laxative. And finally, I did find a chemist who was able to make a a stabilized ion of magnesium in picometer size, which is the size of the ion. And it's a, a picometer size that the, is the mineral ion channel that uh, magnesium goes into the cells. So it's a perfect size. It's a perfect stability. It's ionic. And, you know, the next uh, thing that I would say about that is when you've got all these magnesium compounds, you know how they say, oh, there's seven, eight, 10 different magnesium compounds. Let's just put them all together. And isn't that wonderful? That's the best form of magnesium. But it's not, you don't want a magnesium compound, you want magnesium. So when they talk about the compounds, uh, you'll get a, a magnesium glycinate, but only 75 milligrams of a 500 milligram tablet can be elemental magnesium. So 75 out of 500. So you've got a lot of marketing problems. You know, we were mentioning earlier that there's so much misinformation out there, marketing information. And one magnesium compound that I have concerns about is magnesium L3 and 8. Most of their advertising and on their bottle labels, it says 2,000 milligrams. So they have magnesium L3 and 8, you know, this and that and that, 2,000 milligrams. Well, that's the weight of the whole compound. When you turn the label over, it says, well, actually, you have to take three capsules to get 144 milligrams of elemental magnesium. So in my case, when I couldn't take 50 milligrams, when I finally got my stabilized ionic magnesium, I was able to take 1,200 milligrams in order to get rid of my, I didn't mention I had heart palpitations toward the end when I was really magnesium deficient. So people may need 1,000 milligrams of a elemental magnesium, and there's no way they can get it in the over-the-counter products. You mentioned earlier the 500 to 600 milligrams. Is that in supplements and food? like combined or just food? Or can you explain that a little bit more? Right. If the U.S. Department of Agriculture says we're getting 200, then you need the other 400 by supplements. You can do Epsom salts baths. There are magnesium lotions people can use so that they'll avoid the laxative effect. But we do have to supplement. I say to people, that, well, what are the foods that are high in magnesium? In a sense, that ship has sailed. You can eat your nuts and seeds, your green leafy vegetables and your grains, but you're not going to get enough. And then when you look at the keto diet, which I follow for the most part along with intermittent fasting, when you look at that diet, when we cut back on carbs, we're cutting back on fruits and vegetables. I don't eat much in the way of grains. I find them inflammatory. So we're using diets now that are low in minerals because we're not eating grains, fruits, and vegetables to the extent we used to. So we have to supplement. When they talk about the, the keto flu or you know whatever symptoms people get when they go on a keto diet, I say they're mostly magnesium and mineral deficiencies. And then when you go to take a magnesium, you know, maybe 25, 30% of people will get the laxative effect and they'll, they'll be told, well, you know, when you get the laxative effect, it means 
your body's had enough, you're saturated. And that's not the case. Yeah, just thinking about magnesium rich foods that one would go toward that when you're on a lower carb diet, that's really not going to be an option like bananas, quinoa, black beans, brown rice, like those key pieces, sweet potato, you know, higher in magnesium, but generally not so prevalent in a lower carb diet. You mentioned earlier on the balance between calcium and magnesium. Can you go into that a little bit further? Like what ample calcium does in the body? Does it keep magnesium lowered or like how do we correct this imbalance? Is it just a matter of eating more magnesium foods and supplementing with magnesium and maybe looking at our calcium supplementation or what can we do to kind of make that balance and how, how are they interacting together? Right. We've gotten into a calcified society, basically, because when they discovered uh, osteoporosis, you know, the DEXA scan is, oh my gosh, you're losing bone. What's bone made of? And researchers, they burned bone. And when you burn bone to ash, you look, they did the mineral content and, oh, it's mostly calcium. Okay, so your bones need calcium. Well, they burned away the soft tissue skeletal structure of the bone. The soft tissue is collagen, and collagen makes up, it's the, what is it, most uh, prevalent protein in the body. And its precursors are vitamin C is very necessary to make collagen collagen and elastin together make bones supple and not brittle. So you need magnesium and vitamin C to make bone. You need a lot of other things too. I mean, there's over a dozen nutrients, but when they declared calcium is the treatment for osteopenia and osteoporosis, they relegated so many women to heart disease, bone spurs, heel spurs, gallstones, kidney stones, and soft tissue breast calcifications. And breast calcifications, that's DCIS. It's like a pre-cancer, but all the woman hears is cancer and they want to do surgery to take out the calcification, whereas it's over calcification. But the balancer is magnesium, except we don't promote magnesium. The way calcium and magnesium work together is calcium is the gatekeeper for opening the mineral ion channels to allow calcium into a cell in order to, in muscle cells, make it active in nerve cells to create an action potential. So nerves and muscles depend on magnesium in order to, for their activity. If you don't have magnesium, there's something about the channel can stay open and the calcium will flood in. And that's what causes the excitation, the twitching, the muscle spasms, the tightness, even the tightness of blood vessels to cause high blood pressure, the tightness in the fallopian tubes to cause infertility, which sounds very extreme, the tightness in the bronchial tubes to cause asthma symptoms. So the muscles, we have 600 muscles in our body, 600, and every one of them can be affected by magnesium deficiency. We have 45 miles of nerves in our body that can be affected by magnesium deficiency. So it's pretty important to have a balance, which I say is like 600 milligrams of both. I go for 600 calcium because in the the UK and uh, the World Health Organization, their recommendation is 500 to 700 milligrams of calcium. And I have no idea why they, in the US, they're recommending 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams because there have been enough studies now to show that uh, women who simply take calcium supplements are at a higher risk for heart disease. And that's a, a Dr. Mark Boland in New Zealand that's done a half a dozen studies on that topic. 
You guys have to check out the grill that everyone's talking about. The Schwank Grill heats up to 1,500 degrees to grill the juiciest steak you've ever tasted in as little as three minutes. This is the portable infrared gas grill that'll deliver world-class steakhouse quality steaks like think Ruth Chris, Morton's, Del Frisco's, Cut 432 from your home. It'll be the best grill that you will ever have using infrared heating technology that heats up to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, creating the perfect sear and the juiciest steak you've ever tasted in as little as three minutes. Made in the USA with the same technology used in top steakhouses since the 1980s, now accessible to all of us. Steak, chicken, veggies, salmon, burgers, chicken wings, it'll soon be your favorite thing in your house. At 1500 degrees, you can get that perfect delicious crust on both sides of your steak without overcooking it, and the steak is incredibly juicy and flavorful. There's truly nothing like this grill, and this really is the future of grilling. I'm really just sitting here salivating thinking about these darn steaks. You can use the code KDP to get you $150 off Schwank Grills. Go to schwankgrills.com. That's S C H W A N K Grills and use the code KDP for $150 off. Something I see a lot in my practice also is the connection between iodine need and calcification because when we don't have enough iodine, we can also lead to a calcium shelf situation. And so a lot of those individuals will also be taking calcium, which just leads to further calcification. So what I've learned over the last couple of years when it comes to minerals is they don't just work on their own. It's kind of a -a whack-a-mole game. As you touch one, another will move. And so you really need to look at all of it as a holistic piece. And I think that's what you're touching on when it comes to the calcium of Are you saying if we're going to supplement with magnesium, we also need to supplement with calcium? Or do you feel like it's an individual thing? Or or how are you looking at the minerals overall? Right. Well, with calcium, I really do understand that you can absorb enough calcium from your diet. And I know that I'll just say a sidebar. In my case, if I get a quart of uh, yogurt, and eat it over a two or three day period, overindulge, I get my magnesium deficiency symptoms back because I've got too much calcium. So I know it's being absorbed. So what I do is I, one of my websites, I send people to something called the chronometer, C-R-O-N-O-M-E-T-E-R. It helps you figure out how much you're taking in the way of nutrients. So you can put your diet in the chronometer and it'll add up how much calcium you're getting from your diet. If you're not getting enough, then you'll take a calcium, but hopefully you'll take what I call a picometer calcium, which is the stabilized ion of minerals that I work with. So you get as much as you can from your diet. And if not, then you take a a liquid picometer calcium to go up to 600 milligrams. I'm a, I don't know, of course, we're all biohacking, but in my biohacking days, before I discovered the answers, Leanne, always, I, <laughs> I did uh, on myself, it was, I enjoyed this sort of thing. I put myself on IV chelation. So I put the tourniquet on my arm and put my own needle in do EDTA chelation. After three treatments, my knees were aching. And I said, oh my gosh, of course, chelation, they say, takes out excess calcium and heavy metals, but it was taking out too much calcium. So if I'm not getting enough calcium, if I forget to take my picometer calcium, and right now I'm on a very low dairy diet, then my knees ache. So I have my tell. Magnesium, the tell for magnesium for a lot of people is insomnia, headache, tension, twitching. There's so many, anything about your muscles and nerves, I consider magnesium deficiency until proven otherwise. And you treat with magnesium and if your symptoms go away, then it was magnesium deficiency. What can you expect as you start to supplement with magnesium? I know that, okay, so I have a couple of clients that I've worked with over the years. And when somebody is severely toxic, 
and they have a lot of heavy metal chemical burdens. Magnesium, and maybe you can get into this further because I don't entirely know why this happens, but when we introduce magnesium, it can chelate the metals, which then makes them feel absolutely terrible. Have you seen that when we're bringing in magnesium that people can actually feel worse? And if so, what's happening there? Right. There are a couple of things that happen. And and I have a really robust customer service team. And we tell people, go low and slow. Do not dive into taking a couple capsules or you know, a couple teaspoons or whatever of any magnesium. You go slowly because if it's affecting 80% of known metabolic functions, it's going to stir things up. It might give you more energy than you can cope with. It will detoxify. In terms of feeling worse, there are a couple of things that come up for us. After a, a couple of months on just the picometer magnesium, people might start getting rashes or coated tongue or vaginitis, and that's yeast die-off. The immune system is actually kicking in to the point that yeast are being killed and their toxic byproducts are trying to get out of the body you know, through the skin or whatever. In terms of heavy metals, yes, what happens with heavy metals is if there's not enough magnesium I guess in the magnesium receptor sites, because we know there are over 3,500 proteins have magnesium receptor sites. They were doing a study to find out about magnesium and they stopped at 3,500. So we know that magnesium has receptor sites. If you're magnesium deficient, heavy metals can bind into those receptor sites. So if you start taking magnesium, yes, they will sort of bump out the heavy metal. But I really think that the way I approach it is low and slow. And also if people are toxic, I've written a blog called Too Toxic to Detox. So I really caution people that they get a clean diet, but start with magnesium right away. But there's a clean diet. There are certain B vitamins and a couple of amino acids that promote glutathione production and help the methylation and sulfation pathways in the liver. So you can give people certain things, but I don't believe that people should do heavy liver detox or bowel detox or get ready to take their nutrients. I think the nutrients that the body needs do the job. You don't have to, and I don't believe in in the big flushes because it's too much for for the type of people that approach us that want to get well. They're usually very toxic. So they have to be supported with the the building block nutrients. And, And few people are talking about the basics in this way. Somehow, doctors, the practitioners, when you look at their websites and see their many, many, many products. It's, oh, take this for your bones or take this for your sleep or take this for your immunity. And when you look at the ingredients, it's like, well, they're all similar ingredients. And then you really don't know how much you're getting of anything. Whereas I say, take the building blocks, the vitamins and minerals. I work with a multiple vitamin. I work with picometer silver and All the vitamins are food-based. So if you take those for the cells and not for the systems or the conditions, then the nutrients raise all boats. So if all your cells are healthy, uh, even silver, my research on uh, using a picometer silver, and I don't mean a colloidal silver. Colloidal silver is a silver compound. I just work with the mineral ions. But silver promotes stem cell production, which is awesome. I mean, look at the people that are going to Mexico to get stem cell treatments, whereas they could be taking a a good picometer silver and getting the stem cells, which are then going to go to the tissues that need to be be replaced, tissues that are breaking down faster. And people have gut problems. Well, we need some more gut cells. Let's just direct them there. So that's my philosophy. Just use basic building blocks. 
And so earlier you were talking about how you weren't a fan of magnesium L3 and 8. Was that just because it's cut with other things or do you feel like it has a place or can we talk a little bit about all the different types of magnesium maybe at this point, because there's chelate and glycinate and malate and the list goes citrate, the list goes on and on. Can you explain what these are and which ones are good or bad, or is it a blend or lay it on us? (laughs) Help. You're saying help. Well, I think I said earlier, even magnesium oxide is beneficial. Any magnesium will help a person, but I guess in in our situation where people come to us with problems and they want solutions, then they're looking for magnesium in people who come with atrial fibrillation or migraine headaches. I mean, serious conditions that are treated with serious drugs, they want magnesium. They don't want to have a little bit of magnesium and then a whole bunch of glycine from the glycinate or a whole bunch of the citrate or a whole bunch of the taurine or you know what I'm saying it's you just want that ion what happens in a compound is it will in a liquid solution so in blood it will finally disassociate but for an infinitesimal amount of time and in that infinitesimal amount of time the disassociated magnesium that is separated from the citrate, for example, will be absorbed into the cell. So that's all you get. You wait for the disassociation, you get the absorption, and you know people are helped. But in my situation, you know, I'm a medical doctor and a naturopath, so I look at it from both sides. You know, people need medical. I shouldn't say that because I'm not supposed to say my supplements medically. Sorry. So people want solutions that help them get off medication. So the magnesium L3 Nate just made me so spitfire mad because they did a rat study and they found that in the cerebral spinal fluid after 24, 25 days, there was 7% more magnesium in the cerebral spinal fluid of magnesium l 3 and 8 compared to, I think it was magnesium citrate. 7% better. I mean, 10% is usually the, you know, the standard for mistake. But at a 7%, they started saying they were the only magnesium that could get into the brain. Whereas I could show you studies of magnesium oxide that helps, you know, quote, brain symptoms. And then the three nate part was a real, you know, kind of conundrum because everybody thought it was being made with threonine. If it's threonine, then that has real brain effects, almost neurotransmitter effects. People take threonine tablets. So that was a bit deceptive. But when you look up three onate, T H R E O N A T E, it's a derivative of ascorbic acid. It's nothing to do with threonine. So the whole thing was a marketing scam and then they patented it and it's made out of China, in China. So I don't really understand it. Then with the other compounds, they'll all be beneficial, but they still have to disassociate and they don't have a lot of magnesium. In my Magnesium Miracle book, I put a list of various magnesiums and In a 500 milligram capsule or tablet, there are only 50 to 75 milligrams of magnesium. And so are we looking for on a bottle, a listing of this is how much elemental magnesium there is in the product? Is that what we're looking for? That's what we're looking for. And then we hope that it disassociates. That's why before I worked with my liquid magnesium, I would tell people to get powdered magnesiums. Spin that in water, put it in your smoothies or whatever, or better still, sip it through the day because then you're you're getting incremental amounts in your cells and you're not overloading. But if you put it in liquid, it's going to be better absorbed. And they really haven't done a lot of absorption studies. My company is doing university uh, studies on testing because uh, we haven't gotten there yet, but 
there's no good testing for magnesium. That's why they don't have it on an electrolyte panel because the serum magnesium, which measures only 1% of the total body magnesium is in the blood. The serum magnesium always looks very good. It's in a very tight range. And if it goes low, then the body pulls magnesium from the bones and muscles because the heart depends on magnesium. A lot of the sudden heart attacks in athletes are from magnesium deficiency. They don't replace magnesium in their sports drinks. It's just salt and sugar and maybe some calcium. So where were we going with that question? <laughs> I guess uh, you had mentioned the serum magnesium. Would would magnesium RBC be a better marker to test for? Or you think there's no real way to test whether or not? It's a better marker. I definitely went to RBC, but we're studying an ionized magnesium test, IMAG test. That's at this point a university and research and uh, ICUs are using the IMAG test. And our study um, that we did two years ago, we froze blood from our human subjects. And after two years, we thawed out their blood, retested the IMAG, and it was the same level as two years prior. So we know now that blood can be frozen and tested. So that should start opening things up for labs to take frozen blood and do IMAG testing. Because if you test the ions of magnesium that are available, then you have a better idea of what the body's go going to absorb. So the red blood cell test, it has a wider range. It used to be 4.2 to about 6.5, the range. And uh, after about five or six years, I noticed that the range was down to 3.2. And that's because the population was getting more and more magnesium deficient. And the way blood tests work is the labs look at the range of the people that are coming to the lab. There's no standard. It's created by the labs themselves based on the population, which explains why they went from 4.2 down to 3.2. So if someone comes and gets their RBC done, they, oh, you're 3.2. They won't even tell them, actually. It's not red. If it's not red flag, they don't let a patient know. So if you're 3.3, they're not going to tell you that you're way low and I tell people you have to be up in the six range, 3.2 to 6.8 or whatever that they have. I want to be 6.8. So it's a lot of education about these minerals because um, Big Pharma is controlling allopathic medicine now, and they aren't going to tell us about minerals because they compete with their drug. <laughs> The key to a successful diet is successful snacks. Now, you might disagree with me, but I look at so many food logs in a week. And I can tell you that when we don't have healthful snacks dialed in, like dialed in, we know exactly what makes us thrive, easy access, no GMOs, no sugar alcohols, no gluten, no grain, no corn, no soy, like just healthy, good snacks with no natural flavors or seed oils, just good, pure snacks. When we have that dialed in, when hunger strikes and we have that thing that we reach for time and time and time again, and we are consistent with that, it is the name of the game. Now, of all of the snacks that I have had over the course of the last decade, my absolute favorite snack that I recommend to almost every client that's struggling to just snack healthfully and bridge the gap between meals or even have a little mini meal is 100% grass-fed beef sticks from Paleo Valley. They are by far the most delicious, most nutritious snack out there when it comes to hitting our protein goals. Their sticks are beyond grass-fed and sourced from grass-fed and finished. 
American farms using regenerative practices to restore environmental health. Their high quality beef is so flavorful that they only have to add organic spices rather than MSG, gluten, sugar, and other stuff found in meat sticks. They're also not super chewy. They're just soft and delicious, 100% grass fed, sourced from US family farmers, keto, paleo. They only use organic spices. They're fermented for your gut health. They contain no ECAs. They have zero grams of carbs, zero sugars. They're satiating. They're great for on the go. And they are going to fill that gap. I promise you. So you can find more by going to paleovalley.com slash keto. And on that page, you're going to find my favorite Paleo Valley items. You're going to see the beef sticks there. You can use the code KETO, all in caps, for 15% off when you go to paleovalley.com slash keto. And you mentioned the athletes not replacing their magnesium in those drinks. Do you feel like sodium potassium also has a role in magnesium uptake? My understanding is that like the sodium potassium balance is required to bring the magnesium into the cell. So is that equally as important or not so much? Absolutely important. I mean, at one point you'll ask me if I have a general recommendation for people. <laughs> and That's coming for sure. Yeah. And what am I going to say? I'm going to say you have to hydrate properly and put sea salt in your water. You absolutely need the sodium and sea salt plus all the other minerals in sea salt, there's about 72. So hydration is extremely important. You take your body weight in pounds, divide that in half, drink that many ounces of water a day, and in each liter, you put a quarter teaspoon of sea salt, but you just start with a pinch. So there's your sodium, and you need, you need, need, need that. I mean, there's a big controversy. Oh, do we need it? Do we not need it. Well, they're talking about table salt, which is just sodium chloride without all the other minerals. Potassium, close, close cousin of magnesium. A lot of the potassium symptoms are magnesium deficiency. Potassium deficiency symptoms are magnesium deficiency symptoms. So you do need them both. If we have people who, especially with heart, you know, blood high blood pressure, angina type symptoms, atrial fibrillation, people will take the picometer magnesium and they'll say, well, it's not quite. And uh, we get them to do the chronometer to find out if they're getting enough potassium in their diet. Most people aren't. I'm actually, yes, Leanne, in, in keto, it's low potassium that causes a lot of problems because we used to depend on our green leafy vegetables for our potassium. The amount of potassium in the, the RDA that the government tells us is 4,700 milligrams. The amount of magnesium they tell you to get is 350 to 420. So potassium, we are not taking enough. And then they really messed us up medically because many years ago, there was some potassium medical product that was enteric coated, but it dissolved in the small intestine and caused small intestinal ulcers. It burned the small intestine. So they banned potassium supplements to the extent that they said, you can only supplement with 99 milligrams of potassium per dose. So what are people going to do if they need 4,700 milligrams? You know, they're taking 50 pills. So with my picometer potassium, I made a dose a quarter teaspoon instead of a teaspoon so that in a teaspoon you get almost 400 milligrams. And when you get a stabilized ion of potassium, it's kind of doubling or even tripling what, what you get from a difficult to absorb uh, supplement. So, I mean, there's a lot, I'm saying a lot of words. I know I'm overwhelming people. I think it's fantastic. We've talked about potassium a lot on this show because I struggled a bunch with thyroid dysregulation. And it wasn't until I brought in potassium, like I had my magnesium game on, I've had it on for probably 15 years, pretty on point, but I had neglected potassium. And when I brought potassium in, let me tell you, life was different. And so yeah, I think this conversation, I'm sure a lot of listeners are following 
just really well. I think where we should definitely spend the rest of our time is in understanding like, okay, so you've said a bunch of things, a bunch of stuff. Give me the goods. Like, tell me, like we've talked a little bit about the sea salt in water. Are there specific types of sea salt that we should look for? My personal favorite is Kalima sea salt. I don't know how you feel about that one, but you're saying hydrate. What should we be looking for to magnesium? Like, how do we make this all come together? What do we do? Well, I have to roll back the clock here and just mention about thyroid. Yes, please do. Yeah, it's huge in our uh, female population. You have one child, your thyroid has been drained. And what medicine and even alternative medicine does is they wait for your thyroid blood test to be, you know, not rock bottom, but really low and you're feeling horrible. And then they give you thyroid hormone replacement. And when you mentioned potassium, I remember, yeah, the thyroid hormones require nine minerals for their production, nine minerals. It's not just iodine. It's not just iodine and selenium. It's iodine, selenium, potassium, boron, copper, molybdenum, manganese, magnesium. It's nine minerals. And if you take them, especially in the picometer, uh, stabilized ion form, then I personally got off my arm or thyroid after six weeks. My hands and feet are finally warm again. So we need minerals even for our thyroid. And as for... Um, the sea salt, I tell people to get something that has some color in it. I'm using pink Himalayan right now. I can get a copper colored Hawaiian salt. I kind of rotate them. But if they're white, it means the minerals have been refined out of the sea salt. So that's what I say. Just look for some color in your sea salt and start with a pinch. You know, don't overload your glass because, I'm, oh, I can't stand the taste. Well, you're just not used to it. You just start with a pinch. So do you recommend sea salt, Leanne? Have, is that part of your protocol? Yes, yes. Huge, huge. Yeah, I've switched over time with what I recommend personally. At first, it was the pink Himalayan. Then it was the gray sea salt, more of like a Celtic blend. And now I've moved to Kalima only because for most of my clients, we're dealing with heavy metal toxicity and some of the other salts, though good, will still have metals and I just don't want to add to it. And so I found Kalima to be the best of kind of both worlds, but it's not going to be as rich in the other minerals like a Celtic or a gray or, or those sorts of things. But yes, I am the girl that drinks so much salt. I push electrolytes on all of my friends. Yeah. Salt and water. That's my jam. Wow. That's great. Yeah. I find sometimes with people, we'll just tell them to drink more water and start with the sea salt and they, they feel better. Once you get your minerals going into the cells where they belong, water follows and people don't have the edema that they used to, you know, they can make a fist with their hand without it feeling like they've got little pudgy sausage fingers. It's, incredible how our bodies will just respond to simple input like sea salt. Completely. And I think it's absolutely against what we're being told. Like if we have edema and we can't close our hands, the last thing that we're thinking of is let's drink more water and have salt because we're told that that is what caused the problem. And so I know that that is... You're put on a diuretic. Yes. You are put on a diuretic that takes out your magnesium and your potassium and your sodium too. It's unbelievable how backwards medicine has gotten. You know, high blood pressure, they put people on a diuretic right off the bat because they want to decrease the blood volume. They want to take the pressure off the arteries by dehydrating you. And so your cells are dehydrated, your skin is dehydrated, your you know, the wrinkles are coming up and then you go back to see if your blood pressure is better. It's worse because you've lost all those minerals and they put you on two more drugs. They put you on a calcium channel blocker and magnesium is a natural calcium channel blocker. They know calcium is a problem. And then you come back three months later to get your blood tested to make sure your liver isn't being corrupted by these drugs. And they find out, oh, your cholesterol is elevated. We caught that just in time. 
Oh, your blood sugar is elevated. Oh, look, you're pre-diabetic caused by the drugs and them depleting your minerals. In, in the cholesterol world, we need the cholesterol for our nervous system and our hormones. And yet they keep batting it down lower and lower and lower so they can sell statins. In the um, allopathic medical text, one of the signs of diabetes is magnesium deficiency. So it's just an incredible vicious cycle when you take medications. And I know I'm going on and on, but I want to say everything. (laughs) One last thing, fluoride drugs. Most of the common drugs that you hear about and take are fluoride drugs, which means they add fluoride molecules to the drugs in order to make them absorb better across the cell membranes. So I've got a list here that I'll pull up. You've got ciprofloxin an antibiotic, and it has a fluoride molecule, but it has an FDA warning that it causes tendon rupture. So what happens with the fluoride drugs is in the intestine, the uh, microbiome, the bacteria will break down drugs. That's what they do and release the fluoride molecule. And then that binds with magnesium and makes a brittle substance called cellate, magnesium fluoride, that deposits in tendons and joints. So you've got this, you know, a true reason for toxicity from drugs. Prozac has fluorides, three of them. Paxil has a fluoride. Lipitor has a fluoride, the statin drug. Uh, the worst I find is a flecainide. It's an antiarrhythmic. It has six fluoride molecules. It's used for treating atrial fibrillation. And it's given to people, then it decreases their magnesium, which they need to prevent arrhythmia. Anyway, I think I'll leave it there. (laughs) You just blew my mind. I had no idea that this existed. I I didn't know. Okay, thank you for that. Let me just complete it then. Desflurane is an inhaled anesthetic. It's got six fluorine molecules and it's given during surgery. So if you have a client that says, oh, I haven't felt well since this surgery, the six fluorine molecules have bound up their magnesium and given them all kinds of side effects, the the bradycardia, hypertension, arrhythmia, and tachycardia. And you hear this a lot after surgery and people are treated uh, with uh, beta blockers during and after surgery, and they have a lot of side effects. And they're treated because I I think I'm... I haven't heard anybody talking about this, but it it just, the people I've seen, it just makes so much sense. Prevacid antacid has three fluoride molecules. Diflucan, an antifungal, has two. There were uh, weight loss drugs. Fenfluramine has three. Celebrax, it was pulled. It had three fluoride molecules. Flonase, it was pulled. It had three fluoride molecules. So it made them very effective. I guess, effective according to medicine, but it made them very toxic to humans. Wow. See, I I love my job because I love connecting with people and sharing information, but there's always something that a guest says and I'm like, okay, you've blown my mind. This is it. Uh, now that all the pieces are coming together and I'm thinking of a bunch of people that I've worked with in the past and are currently working with. And so that's really fun. I had no idea. Wow. Okay. We could chat forever about minerals or one of my favorite topics other than macros. So we got to wrap it up. Where can people find more from you, connect with you, learn about your book? Where can they go? Right, right. Well, the current book is Magnesium, The Missing Link to Total Health. And I condensed what I find, what became a 600 page book in the Magnesium Miracle. And I updated it and I put in the the list of the 68 medical conditions. And that's on Amazon, Magnesium, the Missing Link to Total Health. And my website, my educational website is drcarolindean.com. And my store website is rnareset.com. Okay. I will include all of those links in the show notes, guys. So if you're not sure... Where these things are, just click around, find the show notes, and you can click and connect with Carolyn. Thank you again for coming on the show today. This was great. 
Uh, thank you, Lynn. Great to meet you. And thank you for the work you're doing. Thanks for listening. Join us next Tuesday for another episode of the Keto Diet Podcast. Looking for more resources? Go to healthfulpursuit.com for keto meal plans, weight loss programs, low carb recipes, and oodles of free resources to get you going. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program. 